Uh, good morning. Let me talk about this book because I had uh, the possibility of receiving a, a proof, a galley, and I start reading. First I start reading just... Can you hear me? No. I start reading because I was going to have a discussion here with Ariana. And all of a, of a sudden, I started devouring it. So I strongly recommend you this book, Thrive, that it is Ariana's story and her struggle, and at the same time, a lot of philosophy. So I think I, <laughs> I, I strongly recommend it. It will be out in March. All right. Thank you, thank you, Paolo. And of course, Paolo Coelho is quoted in it. We are, going to, we are going to take our seats in a minute, but I just want to say what an honor it is to be sharing the stage with Paolo. I have been a huge fan and a huge admirer for so long. He was born in Rio, I was born in Athens, very different lives. He even ended up in jail. I never did, I'm still aspiring to that. Um, but we've come to some similar conclusions from very different perspectives that we'd like to discuss here with you. So, Paolo. Please, Eliana. So, it's great to be with all of you here. This is the sort of mecca of technology. So, I'm going to ask you to do something counterintuitive, and this is to put your devices aside because there is something amazing about unitasking and uh, being really present for 15 minutes, which is what we have. And um, we want to start by something that Joe said last night when he drank a toast to Hubert, when he said that maybe one day robots will take over, but they will never be able to replace the human heart. And in a sense, this is like an interlude. This is a, a group full of incredibly successful, accomplished people, surrounded by big and small data. But our world is kind of swimming in data and drowning for wisdom. People are connected 24-7 and burning out and stressed out, affecting their health, their wisdom. And these are themes that Paolo has explored for years at the forefront of these discussions that are now becoming mainstream. So, Paolo, for you, a constant theme has been the theme of transformation, that there is always more in us that we can tap into and bring out that leads to our own transformation, that leads to our own destiny. Talk to us about that. I would like to summarize it. It's, it's, it's very complicated. Uh, but once I saw an interview with Paul McCartney and the, the journalist asked him, can you summarize the message of the Beatles? People, they love to ask you, can you summarize the message of your books? And it is a question that it is very complicated because you can't. If you can summarize something, you tweet, but you don't write a book about it. But Paul McCartney, he was brilliant. He said, yes, I can. And he said, Dariana, there is one sentence in one of our songs that say, all you need is love, I think. And there he summarized the message. He summarized the, the, everything we need. You see, Ariana here, she created a platform for us to share. And sharing is one of the most important things that we have. Love is sharing, work is sharing, everything is sharing. That's why we have this tendency to share uh, with devices and things like this. But at the end of the day, if you talk about politics, if you talk about romance, you only have four stories, four, to tell. So, the first story is a love story between two people. The second story is a love story between three people. <laughs> yeah. 
The third one is the a struggle for power. And the fourth is a journey. So if you read any news about politics, any book, whatever, you are going somehow to read one of these four stories. The thing is that there are many variations to these four stories. And at the end, we have a goal. And our goal is to answer this question that, again, I tell you, I don't ask myself this question, but the question is, what am I doing here? We have to answer this question, a tricky question, very tricky question, because there is no answer. I was talking to, to Gino, a scientist, and he had an explanation, a framework. Are you here, Gino? No. Oh, yeah, he's there. A framework and a methodology to answer this question, but I said I don't believe in this answer. And because at the end of the day, we don't know. We have to respect the fact that we live in a mystery and recognize this mystery in the Greeks. They're the kings and the queens of mystery, of respecting mystery. So, Ariana, I don't know if I can answer your question. I know that I want to be here 100%. When I'm here, I'm here. I'm looking to Hubert, who had this fantastic idea of this, this shift that we're seeing now. And, uh, and at the end of the day, we just do, and we respect to what we are doing. Let me ask you a question. Uh, what drove you to create the Huffington Post? In, in, of course, we have. <laughs> so for me, what you said about sharing is what led me to the Huffington Post. You know, I felt the conversation was moving online, and I wanted a platform that combined great journalism with the opportunity for anybody with something interesting to say to say it. But in the course of developing the Huffington Post, and being kind of connected 24 seven, I went through my own personal struggle that you know about from the book, which led to my collapsing from exhaustion in 2007, breaking my cheekbone, and uh, f getting five stitches on my right eye. And that started me on my own journey, story number four, of discovering, is that really what success is? Is it success to really be burning out and? Um, undermining your health. And that led me to this question that you're asking also in your new book, Manuscript Found at Accra, uh, which is, what is a good life? The Greek philosophers used to ask that all the time. And our world has defined a good life in very simplistic terms as being successful in terms of two metrics, money and power. And I feel there is that third metric that you've been writing about, which is the third metric that brings together our well-being, our wisdom, our capacity to wonder at the mystery of life, and giving. And when we introduce these elements back into our life, our life is transformed. I call it being transformed from struggle to grace. So I see now this as the next journey of my life. How do we make that part of the Huffington Post, but also part of what we are all doing? And you know what is interesting? There is no trade-off between being productive and creative and tapping into the deeper part of ourselves. On the contrary, when we give ourselves that time, we are more creative, we are more productive. I mean, you wrote The Alchemist in two weeks. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Yeah, clearly, it was coming from such a deep part of yourself. Steve Jobs wrote um, and told his uh, biographer, Walter Isaacson, that some of the deepest and most important insights that he had that led to the iconic Apple products came after Zen meditation. So we are now at a turning point where a lot of these things which were seen as on the margin, even though clearly people were longing for it. I mean, your book sold... 65 million copies. Maybe. Uh, no, more, more. More. Shall I say? See, I'm sorry, I'm underestimating. 170 million. Wow. One... 
Okay, 170 million copies of a book that is ultimately about this journey of transformation. That is phenomenal. It shows what a longing there is out there. And now, a lot of the things that you wrote about in The Alchemist and you've been writing in all your books are now mainstream. You now have CEOs coming out of the closet saying that they are meditating or they are bringing mindfulness practice into their lives. You have Mark Benioff from Salesforce and Mark Bertolini from Aetna and all around the world. So this is a very exciting time to be on this journey. And for you, having started it so many years ago, how different does it feel? I think that people are much more open to it, but they try to hide. I can give you again, use a Gino as an example. Stand up, Gino, please. <laughs> Gino, Gino lives in Hong Kong, and uh, he's a professor, and he's trying to map the connection between uh, the human body and the things that are invisible. So we sat down and started talking about his work, my work, and at the end of the day I said, Gino, but it is about spirituality. And he said, yes, but if I tell people, am I lying? <laughs> if I tell people that it is about spirituality, I cannot, I cannot go to, to some universities and start talking <laughs> okay, <laughs> which I also respect, you know, because he has another vision. I think we should not think that spirituality is, is spirituality can be summarized in something. Do what you have to do. It's not about believing in God. It's not about uh, abstractions. It is by living, honoring your life every single minute. Every, every moment of your life. But then you will have to hide because he's here. <laughs> and not because, only because of that, because people feel that they're stepping to a very sulfurous area in a very complicated area. And then we start creating a lot of mythology around spirituality. And when at the end of the day is just to live the present moment, period. And also because the confusion between organized religion and spirituality. But now again, if you look at the place of death in our life, I think that's a great entry point. I find it amazing that this is the one universal thing that connects all of humanity. You know, The Onion, the satirical magazine in the United States, had a story recently, and the headline was, Death Rate holds firm at 100%. <laughs> so given that this is a reality, isn't it amazing how uncurious we are, how little time we are spending integrating it into our lives, not in a morbid way. No, no, no. You know, um, the, the Romans used to carve memento mori, MM, on statues and uh, trees, not out of morbidity, but because it puts everything in perspective. The theme of the conference this year is content and context. Well, death provides context. And I was recently at a friend's memorial and listening to the eulogy, I thought to myself, a eulogy is completely different from a resume. <laughs> you know, when you hear people eulogized, you never hear, you know, George was amazing. He increased market share by one third. <laughs> or, Mary, you know, she made SVP at the age of 35. You know, the eulogies are always about the other things, the things that you write about, the things that um, bring joy in life, the things that touch our hearts, poetry, music, smiles. And yet we don't live our lives in terms of what ultimately our life is going to be about. But you know why? Because people don't realize that there is a finishing line, something called death, you know? So we spend most of our time either thinking about life, how should we live our life, or trying to do something to avoid this nightmare that sooner or later it will knock 
our door. I can give you a very quick example. Two years ago, I almost died. Uh, so I went to, to see my heart for different reasons. And I had to have a heart operation very quickly. And then I had one night to think about my life. And I said, oh my God, I'm here by my side with the woman that I love. And I've been married for 34 years with her. B, I did every crazy thing in my life, every single one you think I did, you know, from all drugs uh, to whatever. Huh? <laughs> A very intense sexual life, as you may guess. The <laughs> Third, I decided that I was going to fulfill my dream, that it is to be a writer, and it was nonsense. Nobody can make a living out of writing, but I, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to write. I'm not thinking about making a living. And fourth, I succeeded in what I was doing. So, meaning, I'm not alone, I can share, I can, uh, well, really share. And I, I had a tablet by my side, and I was reading, I said, oh, the only thing that I will not know if I die tomorrow, because the doctor said you can die tomorrow, is the end of the Syrian conflict. That was two years ago. I was reading New York Times. I, said, I, I don't know how this is going to end. If I die today, I still don't know how, how the Syrian conflict will end. But in any case, this is my real experience. So accepting death as a companion, Ariana. As uh, someone who is sitting here, look at you, look at me, and asking us to live the present moment. And give to this present moment a sense, a reason. You don't need to believe in God. You just need to believe in life. And, ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. But uh, you need to believe in life. If you believe in life, then it is enough. And this is what you do also, I guess, you no? Know? When you have your, all, all the things you did in your life, because I had 90% uh, of your book, uh, you also are someone who believes in life. Well, it's also um, what you write in one of your books about um, what the Yaki Indians consider death as a, an advisor, and they ask that, and they ask death, you know, how should I live my life? It affects the choices we make, and it also affects the way we react to things. I love this conversation that you have between the Zen master and the samurai. And I, I want to read you just one little part of it, because I love it. Um, the Zen master says, now that is hell, letting yourself be angered by silly things. And then this, the um, samurai asks him, so what is heaven? And he says, and that is heaven, not reacting to silly provocations. But if you look at our daily lives, so often we are upset by silly things, we are reacting to silly provocations. That's why, in a sense, you are a stoic philosopher. I mean, a lot of stoicism is about reaching what Marcus Aurelius called, you know, that inner citadel, that place in us, which we all have. You know, it's a place of wisdom, strength, peace. But most of the time, we don't live there. Absolutely. So how can we create paths to return there faster and faster and spend more time in that place? You know, Ariane, I don't think it is a journey itself. It is a moment, a moment that you take a decision. I will do this, and it will be difficult. Huh? The first day, the, but then you try to grab the present moment as strongly as you can. And you have to be there with all your heart and with no way out. From the moment that you are there, from the moment that you are connected to yourself, there will be a lot of distractions, but little by little, distractions will go away. This is at least how I managed, but I don't have a formula. There are no formulas in this subject. True. There are no algorithms. You understand? There is no software. So you have to tell to yourself, again, what I'm doing here, I don't have the answer to this question, but I want to be here. And little by little, you adapt yourself to be at the present moment. 
Well, what is exciting now is that the scientific findings have been extraordinary in the last few years around these realities. You know, whether it's uh, Richard Davidson's work around compassion and uh, well-being, uh, whether it's the neuroscientists' work around the impact of mindfulness on creativity, innovation, well-being, it shows that these things are real, they can transform our lives, and it doesn't matter what the entry point is. I love that in your writing. Uh, what the wake-up call is, what that magical moment is. It can be a wake-up call like mine when you collapse from exhaustion. It can be a worse wake-up call when you get a health scare. It can be a piece of poetry. It can be... Um, Absolutely. It can be a child that you bring to the world and fall in love with. It doesn't matter what the entry point is. What matters is to be awake in yeah. our lives. Yes, uh, Marcel Proust, it was a Madeleine. No, so he saw Madeleine and he smelled. So, uh, our awakening moment, it is there for us to recognize. We have several a day we don't recognize because we are too used to our lives. And, uh, and then life changed. Let me, because we only have one minute. And 24 seconds. <laughs> life is running fast. So, for example, now we have e-books, new platforms. And uh, it's very difficult to, to separate the physical book from the e-books. This is something that uh, I, I want to... to to see here. And they are pricing the e-books with the same price with uh, physical books. Why? Because they think that if you price a new book uh, for three dollars and the, the, hard cover, uh, the hard copy is seven, people are going to stop going to bookstores, which is totally nonsense. People who read physical books will read physical books forever. People who read uh, electronic books, they're a totally different way. Same thing happens to us. So I'm fighting, just when there's the thing, I'm fighting for, for having my books. I'm fighting, no, I'm going to. <laughs> because there's a moment that you have to use your so-called power to do something that it is good uh, and that you believe in. So from today on, from the end of January on, my, bo my books will be priced uh, <laughs> not zero, zero, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, 399 And then the same shift, you know? You still continue to do, to believe that life is a physical book when there is new platforms. And at the end of the day, the book is something that brings you to a place and leaves you there alone. It's up to you to take your decision. Actually, I completely agree with you. There are people like me who will always love physical books. And uh, in fact, if you try to create a space in your life which is free of technology, I've tried to create that because it helps my sleep, it helps my meditation. I've made my bedroom, for example, a device-free zone. So I only read real books in bed. So it doesn't matter how, what the price differential is. If you love the feeling of real books, if you like underlining books and all those things, you'll keep buying them. And recognizing the new realities while loving you know, the old uh, realities, whether it's books or anything, is part of the hybrid future we are going into. So since we are out of time, I would just like to end by saying that um, the... The very profound uh, lesson that I took from The Alchemist when I read it many years ago, and I carry with me, in fact, I have it laminated in my wallet. It's too long to read, but I want to give you the essence of it, which is this shopkeeper sent his son to learn about the secret of happiness from the wisest men in the world. And he wandered through the desert for 40 days and finally came upon a beautiful castle high atop a mountain. It was there that the wise man lived. But rather than finding a saintly man, he found an amazing hive of activity, 
Tradesmen came and went. People were conversing in the corners. A small orchestra was playing soft music, and there was a table covered with amazing food. So the master told the boy to look around the palace and return in two hours. But I ask you, he said, as you wander around, carry this spoon with you without allowing the oil, the drops of oil that are in the spoon to spill. The boy began climbing and descending the many stairways of the palace, keeping his eyes fixed on the spoon. After two hours, he returned to the room where the wise man was. So, the wise man said, did you see the Persian tapestries that are hanging in my dining hall? Did you see the garden that it took the master gardener 10 years to create? Did you notice the beautiful parchments in, a li in my library? The boy was embarrassed and confessed that he had seen nothing because his only concern had been not to spill the oil that the wise man had entrusted to him. Then go back, the master said, and observe the marvels of the world. So the boy went, and when he returned, the wisest of wise men said to him, well, there is only one piece of advice I can give you. The secret of happiness is to see all the marvels of the world and never to forget the drops of oil on the spoon. So in a sense, everyone here is right in the middle of the world, seeing and living the marvels of the world. And what we need is to remember the two oil drops of oil on, in the spoon, which is basically our soul, our heart, whatever you want to call it, what Archimedes, my compatriot, called the place from which we can stand and move the world. So we can do both. But if we do one without the other, we pay a very, very heavy and increasingly unsustainable price. Thank you so Bravo. much. Bravo. That's it. Thank you.